Hi, I'm Brian Mason. We recently interviewed Buck and Annie Herring of the second chapter of Acts. Originally, we were planning to release this as a single program, all three interviews, Buck and Annie Herring, and then Annie separately and Buck separately. What they did, though, they provided us with so much great information, we couldn't do it. So we've separated them into three separate interviews, three separate programs. Right now, I hope you'll enjoy this interview with Annie Herring. step along the way I need you here All right, we're talking to Annie Herring now. We got Buck out of here. So. No, I just wanted to a- ask you. He's, but he's such a he's such a good. He remembers all the names of people. Well, things I don't remember anything. Go. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, you, sure. Well, and it's not for for separate memories or anything like that. But I just wanted wanted to talk to you. And if I've asked these questions already, because there were a number of questions I wanted to ask you, uh-huh. and I, I I found myself asking you when he was in here. So if I've That's asked fine. him before uh, to say, we've already talked about that. No, growing up, you, you grew up in, was it Northern Idaho? Not Northern North Idaho, Dakota. North Dakota, North right. North Dakota. With eight siblings. There yes. were nine kids. Yes. Catholic family. Yes. Very. Okay. Um, and you're right in the middle, right? Fifth I, am, I am the fifth child. I'm the best balanced, of course, <laughs> as we all know, because... Of my position. <laughs> my mom and dad had five kids the first six years of their marriage. And then wow. uh, they waited uh, and had another one six years later to my little brother, Tony. Wow. So I was a baby for a while, and I was really my father's baby. I, I, I think I, I, have a, I had a special relationship with him because... When my, the rest of the kids would go to school and Dad had some time, I can he- still hear my mother saying when Dad would leave the house, Walter, take Anne. So I obviously was a bore, uh, <laughs> made her crazy. I can't imagine that I would do that. <clears throat> but um, 
then the, the reason that, that we have a, a second family is because we're Catholic, as you well know, and my mother uh, was ha- in confessional, and she said, you know, Father, I have five children, and he says, well, you know, just do, you've done your duty, just do whatever you can do. <laughs> right. This is kind of personal, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way it goes, right? Cut, edit. Okay, edit. <laughs> so anyway, so five years later, we move, and we move to a different parish, and she talks with Father Anthony, and she says, Father, and he says, Yo, your body does not, your body belongs to your husband. Sorry, that's it. So she got pregnant, and I remember distinctly, I was uh, f- almost six, and, oh no, I was five and a half, almost six, and she, she it was his baptismal. And we all, my mother, we, we, in my family, they would pass these gorgeous, this gorgeous, gorgeous baptismal gown that was just beautifully made and would hang all the way to the floor. You know, one of those, mm. you know, mm-hmm. beautiful baby pictures, you know. And it would pass around for all my mo- my mom's sister and sisters and brother. They would, every time they had a child, they would send off this baptismal gown. So we all got it. Sure. And I remember her at the front of the step on his baptismal day as she's walking up to Father Anthony, and it was just right after Mass, and so there were, everybody was around, and she's holding him, and she goes, Father, I want you to meet your son. This is Anthony. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> whoa, she's a daring soul. <laughs> and I didn't catch on to it until I was later, you know, but... And I, Okay, that's my mom. Crazy. Wow. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, but it was it was fun. But I was glad that I was fifth one. Okay, fifth one. And give me give me so how many sisters above you? And... I have two sisters above me. Okay, so two brothers and two sisters above, above me, and then okay. I have uh, two brothers and a sister under me. Okay, three brothers and a, three three brothers and a sister under me. Okay, so yeah, you're pretty much in the middle of of, of all of it. Yeah, I am. So your mother played, I'm, I'm reading, oops, where's this it's, book? Yeah. Uh, I got this book over here, this book called Glimpses, which was a book that was put out, uh, a companion book to an album that you released sometime well, ago. Well, it wasn't really, but it, but it was the same t- area, same time. Okay. But it, yeah. Okay. It, 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 but um, in it, it tells a little bit about um, your growing up, and, and it, but it does talk about you singing with some of your sisters and your mother playing the piano. Oh, and, yes. And you're really, like, you're five years old yes. singing. Oh, yes. Um, you remember? Oh, I, of course I remember. It was so much fun. And we used to sing uh, for, like, for grain elevator openings and for all kinds of farm <laughs> stuff, you know, but it was fun. It was just great. Still scared to death, you know, but... I sang with my two older sisters, and they had absolutely beautiful voices. My older sister's voice was, she could probably pl- sing anything. She was she was like a lyric, so, lyric soprano, and she could sing really low, too. She just had this broad range, like a bird. And then my sister Catherine had a, a, a real o- more, more open, mellow, a touch, a touch like Nellie's, but Nellie's was a little bit um, wider, mm-hmm. range-wise. Um, and then there was me. And so S- Stephanie sang the lead, and then Catherine would usually sang the, the, either the alto or tenor mm-hmm. part underneath it. But then if it got down too low, I couldn't sing it. So I found myself just like Matthew, you know, bouncing around going, okay, I'll <laughs> sing that note because she's not singing that note. So I'll sing that note. Okay, I'll sing that. But it was fun doing that. And it was, it was really, really good. And I remember that we were on our way to, um, uh, Lawrence Welk was looking for a female group, and he's from North Dakota. Oh, that's yeah. right. So it's not Very like, odd, you know, yeah. odd that he'd be looking. And so we were on our way to go audition, and I got sick, and they had to turn around and come back. And I know in a lot of people's eyes, they probably thought, what a horrible thing. And of course, I felt terrible. Uh, and then the Lennon sisters were the, the group that was picked. Yeah. And so whenever we, we would see the Lennon sisters, you know, there would be kind of this little thing that <laughs> we'd compare ourselves with them and go, nah. We could have done that. God, that's it. You know. <laughs> but um, but it, it, uh, now I look at it, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful we didn't. I'm very grateful that none of the world stuff really got me. All the singing that you did with your sisters and stuff, mm-hmm. none of you had music 
lessons. None of you. Oh, no. You just, it was just a natural thing natural. that you did at your house. Yeah. And you weren't, it wasn't a wealthy household where you, no. you guys, um, you just sang because you loved to sing. It was a family yes. that loved to sing we together. We loved to sing. Just loved to sing. I remember there was a, remember one particular afternoon, isn't that funny? You know, some days just come and go sure. and some will never leave you. Yeah. And I was up in the, uh, at uh, Olaf Lar no, Art Greenberg's old farm. And that's where we were living at the time, outside of Grand Forks. And my brother Frankie and I, we love to sing together. And he's the one that's just right above me. We're closest in age. And he's um, a very good singer. He has one of those big, mellow voices, you know. Very, He's very good. But we'd sit, we sat up in the tree with where the limb would, was bouncing <laughs> and we found this finally found this rhythm that we could both find. it was the coolest tree because you sit out sat on one limb and then the other limb was behind you so I mean we were just <laughs> heaven you know and we're just singing and I remember us just singing our guts out that afternoon and just loving it just it was just such a thrill just to and you know, you, those are the things that the, that that build how things are supposed to be. You know, that's how you're supposed to feel when you sing. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah. So that was you and that brother. You've got you and your other sisters and your mother playing piano. Uh -huh. And, of course, you and Nellie and Matt later on. Was there ever a time that the whole family on a Christmas or whatever time that everybody sat around the piano at home or whatever, everybody was together We usually singing? did that at Christmas. It was just a natural thing on Christmas Eve to sit around the tree and watch my father put on that beautiful star. And um, that was the last thing that always went on the Christmas tree. And it, it was beautiful. It had blue little tips and the, and the light would shine through it. It's a, it it's an, I'm sure it's, it, well, it's very old probably came from Norway, you know, uh, but he would put that up there. And in our drabby house, just have Christmas lights. It just made, it made you feel like you were in a palace because the lights were so beautiful. And then we could adore the Lord that he was born. We loved Christmas. We loved singing Christmas carols together. And it was really, 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 really precious and special. And then once in a while, like if we went to a movie, um, like Moulin Rouge, let's say, it would be a very rare occasion that we'd go. But my mother would get the sheet music and then she'd play and then we'd sing that song. And I just loved that song for some reason. <laughs> but for all of us to sing together at one time, it kind of almost it was impossible because of the, the, the age range between uh. Stephanie and Matthew. Stephanie was the oldest. Stephanie's the oldest, and I think she's like 19 years older than Matt, I think. She's six years older than I, 12, 6, 12, yeah, eight, yeah. Wow. Yeah, 18 years. Yeah, that's good. My mother was pregnant with Matthew when my older sister got married. Isn't that crazy? That's older than the Von Trapp family singers. That's I know, more really, of an edge on that. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, she was 45 when she had Matthew. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And so what are your memories when, when your mom, who got sick yes. for, for some time, of course, were you, were you were out definitely gone from the home by the time she was getting sick? Is that right? I was... Um, you were already in I California? Was 12. Thir oh, when 13, she, yeah. Okay, when she was getting so sick. So it was... I know. I was about. I take that back. I was fifteen. Okay. And um, of course, it was devastating to to watch your mother, you know, go through what she went through. I'm not going to go through what she did because you don't need to hear any no, of that. No. But it was really um, uh, 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 watching pieces of her go away, and and yet she was uh, capable of still so much. But the, the the struggle of that was 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 hard and 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 feeling totally inadequate because I was uh, that was very very hard and t trying to do things take care of the family in ways and I I just wasn't I just wasn't very good at it I just was not and that frustrated me also but I was going to, you know I was in high school I was working. Um, and my life was just extremely hard and fun. I mean, I had fun. I'm not saying I didn't have fun, but I, I started working when I was 
12 uh, as a dishwasher and half waitress and then worked um, at a pretty nice restaurant for a while there. And then we moved from uh, North Dakota to uh, Sacramento, California. And that was in my senior year. So I was, uh, it was 16 going on 17. We came out, Matthew and Nellie and Jack and my mom all came by train. And so we went up through the north. Of course, I had never been any place further than, you know, 80 miles away from my home was like forever. <laughs> never did that much. So it was a, a real trek. And to see a mountain for the first time in your life, you know, I saw Mount Shasta. I couldn't believe how beautiful that mountain was. And I'd see, you know, the, the mountains, you, 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 the trains weave around those mountains. So every, you see the mountain over here, and then you see the mountain over here, and it was just <laughs> it was so thrilling. But that was a, a tough trip, and we went to stay with my mother's sister in uh, Rancho Cordova, very gracious. And then eventually my dad came out after they sold the house and got everything settled with the, my youngest, with my the brother right under me and, um, and the brother above me. So Frank and Tony came out with my dad. And then we got a house in Rancho and then blah, blah, blah. And yeah. yeah. It's, and is that where your mom passed away? Mm -hmm. She did. And then your father, two years later. Two years later, almost to the day, he. Um, it was an amazing thing when we when we buried my mom. My dad looked at us and he said, two years from now, I'll be right there with her." And I said, "Dad, don't talk like that," you know. So, um, as little money that we had, he went and got some insurance for his funeral, and two took years care. later, he took care of things. Yep, he took two years later, right there. And it was, it, you know, it's hard to, when you have to tell a, a little boy, you know, he, he was 10, you know, your mother. Has, and I remember holding him and, and rocking him. Matthew. Yeah, in his rocking chair that mom gave him. She, I think that's the only big gift I think she ever gave to anybody was to Matthew, was that rocking chair. And so I remember holding him and just, and just, it was a very sweet connecting. And it was almost like the Lord saying to me, hold on, baby, something's going on. But I didn't know the Lord, but, but you could feel that, the power of that. Right. And so I thought, okay. So I tucked that in here, and it's been tucked in there ever since. And then when, um, then when Dad died, it, um, we just knew that we had to... And you know what? When we, when Buck said yes, let's let's take them, we had built a relationship somewhat with them. They had been with us for about oh two weeks before my dad died, and so they were familiar with Buck, and they were familiar with Hollywood, and they so they were not so it wasn't just cold, going into somebody totally yeah. that they didn't know at all, right. and um, and to watch the transformation of the. Uh, of Matthew and Nellie, and uh, I look back at it now, and I, I, I don't know how in the world we did it, but I do know that it's the grace of God, and he always gives us the strength we need to go through what we need to do, and it's just like, you know, uh, Corey Ten Boom says, you don't use a ticket until you need it <laughs> to get on that train, so I have learned a lot about that ticket, and a lot of that ticket, the important thing is denying yourself. In picking up your cross and following him. It has nothing to do with trying to become something that you're not. You know, and learning that. I, I learned a lot with, with Matthew and Nellie, obviously. You know, we get so frustrated with the Lord sometimes, you know, because we think we're supposed to grow and be strong and do all those kinds of things. And I felt like such a, 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 a failure at many things. I never, I never felt like I was a failure as a daughter of the king. But I wanted to, to, I wanted to do more. I wanted to be able to embrace better um, the, 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 what I saw in, in Matthew and Nellie and, and my husband and, and all in our lives. I wanted to know how to embrace it better and to build it up better and to be a, a stronger person, which I, I'm not strong. And 
and I was just I remember just weeping my eyes out and walking down the road and you know, I said, God, I'm just not learning anything. I was like, man, I'm, I'm just not learning. And I heard him just say, are you saying I'm a bad teacher? <laughs> I said, oh, oh, no, you're a good teacher. And then he took me back over the year at the things that I had learned. And I would have never, ever, ever learned any of those things or gone down the roads that he had chosen for me to go, go down. The people that um, he allowed to put in our lives and my life to change us and to help us to uh, for me particularly, to, to dare to trust and d depend on others and their gifts. And I, I learned that very early uh, when the Lord started teaching me how to play piano and receiving songs. It took me about a year before I could dare sing and play at the same time. So when that happened, then there was this other thing that, that came up in me, and then Matthew and Nellie came to live with us, and then they were shocked. You know, everybody's shocked. You play piano. Oh, great. And then they would just sit down beside me and sing. And they would, before, I, I would say, I got a new song from the Lord today. They come home from school. Yeah, okay. <laughs> They'd pull up their little chairs. We'd sit down and we'd just sing. And, and before the song was even over, they, had, you know, they, they, could, they heard the harmonies in the chords and they, would, they just sang. And looking back at that, I realized that it was truly the time of our lives where he was mending our broken hearts because we had we, we'd been broken. I mean, you, you can't lose your parents and, and up your whole life being uprooted and then being new, a new creature in Christ and being in a new marriage and being in a new... Everything was new. Everything, everything demanded all of your attention. Right. Thank you very much. And, and, it, and without, without the normal resources that most people have, like money, we didn't have anything, you know, and yet God provided completely for us. Sometimes we didn't have money for rent, and we had this great big, beautiful prayer meeting at our at our house every Tuesday night. And um, there's a lot of miracles that happened there, piles of them. Um, wonderful time. But I remember one time where I'm going, oh my gosh, we don't have any money for our rent. So the next morning after. Tuesday night prayer meeting, I look up on the mantle and I'm cleaning it off. You don't clean the top of the mantle every day, you know, but I sure. just happened to clean it off and all of a sudden, whew. And there was the exact amount for our rent and no one knew what it was. We, we didn't let anybody know that we needed, you know. And there was exactly that. Somebody from the Bible study had just, left. Just, I, I gather. I gather. It's like one time we were on the road and I didn't have any money for shoes and my black shoes were shot and I needed, I needed black shoes. And I'm thinking, oh, we are, what am I going to do? So we, I was kneeling down praying and be, right before we were leaving in the bus and, and, and the Lord said, look under the, look under the bed. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> I looked under the bed and here was a pair of brand new black shoes, exactly what I needed in my size. Can you believe that? I just, I just, I just started giggling. I said, "Oh, this is just so cute." <laughs> you don't want to tell anybody about this. They're going to think you're nuts. Well, it's true. I really am. <laughs> and that was so fun. Oh my goodness! Look under the bed. Wow. Um, when I talked to Matt about the first time the three of you sang together, if I understood him correctly, it sounded like you all, the three of you, were taking a walk. Am I getting? Do I remember yeah. correctly? You, you were taking a walk, and, and I don't know if you asked them to sing, hey, do you not, can you sing this or whatever, and yeah. and it just happened. Yes. I mean, you, you were talking about sitting at the piano and playing, and they just kind of picked out parts. But was there a walk that was involved? Yes, in, there in... was a walk from the river. It was um, It was actually before, before Dad died. Mm. And uh, I, I, Nellie wasn't with us at that that time and know story you know, you know my sister always says there's nine kids in our family so we're going to have 18 different sides of every story because they change their minds you know so you sure. have this and then you have that but, 50 plus years ago so <laughs> but i remember um walking from the river from the american river up back up to dad's house and and i started singing and he started singing and then i said something to him and he started singing whatever it was that I said, and he just, uh, that was when I went, oh, oh my gosh, oh my goodness, oh my, my, 
this kid, this kid can sing. You know, it's like, you know, we all, we all could sing, but he was, you know, had this thing on him that was just from the get-go. You never knew it until then? Well, I, well, I knew he could sing, but I didn't know he could sing he could like sing. that. <laughs> you know? Wow. And just kind of riffing around, and you know, just but beautiful, the tone and texture. I mean, his his voice at that st- stage, you know, is uh, unchanged, and and it had uh, that uh, the, the element in there. It was just a, a delight, it was that burgeoning beauty that you have when you're that age and yep. you're a boy. It was gorgeous. In 1985. Um Oh, the um, a bunch of artists got together in Hollywood. Quincy Jones, in fact, Michael o. Martin was co-producer. Uh, what was that called? Um, the, the, they all got in a studio together and they recorded the song for Ethiopian Relief, um, African Relief. Um, oh, okay. We are the world. Remember, yeah. we are the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christian artists got together after the Dove Awards that night in April. <clears throat> And recorded a song called Do Something Now. Steve yeah. Camp and Phil Madeira wrote this song. Yeah. And you guys couldn't stay for the taping, the videotaping, mm-hmm. but you were able to come in and, and record your audio yes. part. Yes. And um, I was asked to come in and help with the video crew because they were a secular company and they didn't know Sandy Patty from Larnell Harris. They right. just didn't know who's who and say, can you help us spot people? And I said, yeah, give me uh, a, yeah, 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 I can help. So just give me something to do. So, um, the crack up to me was they were doing playback the whole time. And yeah. so your stuff was coming in and Matthew's part, um, Jesus said, yeah. where, where he did his part and it's just very distinctive. Nobody else <laughs> I know could do that part. And they were going, now, who's that? Where is that guy? And they're looking, they're saying, it's a black guy. Where is he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Said, no, yeah, it's yeah. not a black guy. And he's not here. They're not he's, here. Today. They've, they've had here. to leave already. But no, Oh, that was so fun. I, I remember doing that. I remember, Matthew, that particular uh, uh, take. Um, it was a fun night. But he, he really did. There was something spectacular that happened. Yes. You know, and yeah. that's, that, that was so much fun because I know Buck used to say to me, I just don't know what, what, what he's going to sing. It's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, it's always good, but it comes off, you know. And he said, and I love it when he has a sore throat or if he has a problem. <laughs> and he's not happy with his voice, and all of a sudden this stuff comes out, and it's just, oh, that's just grand. <laughs> you know, you, know? you got to love it. He, oh, you do. He's absolutely phenomenal. I told you earlier today, this is the first time we've actually met face-to-face and said hello. Yeah. I introduced you on stage, probably in the 80s sometime, when you guys came and did a concert in Nashville. And backstage, um, you guys are getting ready to go on, so you and Nellie are straightening collars, and Matthew's doing his thing in the dark backstage, and I'm getting ready Matthew's to go. Matthew's doing his thing? What was that? Exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. He was... <laughs> I don't, who primping. knows what he was doing? <laughs> but anyway, you guys are primping, getting yeah, ready, yeah. standing in the dark backstage, and I'm getting ready to go on. And so I turn and go, hi, you know, so yeah. hi, how are you? Kind yeah. of as far yeah. as we got, because you guys are re- definitely focused. preparing, focused to go yeah. on. Um, it occurred to me the interesting thing of, and I'll pull up a, a graphic, but the early albums of peasant blouses and and the blue jeans and yes. just the look of what it was like in the early 70s. Yes. And by this time it was like silk yeah. blouses. Yeah. And it was just, I mean it was what yeah. the times was yeah. about but it was like my how we've grown. It's like it was so cool. <laughs> well, they, and they've yet they've grown up. <laughs> and yet and yet you guys were unaffected yeah. by uh, in the heart and in what you were singing mm-hmm. and in lyric and everything else. It was um yeah. That, that was just. Uh... I think it was because we, for for many, and this is a funny story on me, but I felt that everybody just came together because they wanted to worship the Lord, and 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 that's that's what it was. I mean, everybody came together to worship the King, and so we were at uh, I think San Diego uh, uh, University there, and it was a huge auditorium. But in the back, there was a balcony, and and it was light enough in the evening where it was backlit. So all you could see were like the silhouettes of people walking and whatever. And we're singing. And then I see some, I see some people walking and some people just stop and they listen. And you know what? That was the first time I thought, Oh, 
people are listening to us. You know, they, they oh dear, it scared the bejeebies out of me. Because <laughs> I'm just sitting there, we're all missing all together. You know, I wasn't thinking anybody was coming to listen. And I, it was such a funny thing. And I'm thinking, whoa, slow. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I was expecting. Wow. Um, we did talk once upon a time, and I want to say this would have been in the maybe the mid 80s, when Keith Green died yes. in 1982. Mm hmm. Um, I would typically do a radio show around the time of his death dedicated just to talk. We'd play all, you know, just his music. And sure. I would try to talk to people that knew Keith and, and would have a story or two about him and what sure. he was like and stuff. And and you called in that morning and um, I said, you got a story? And you just had a wonderful, I didn't, I don't remember everything about it, but I did kind of um, set you up for it a little bit earlier. Um, about a birthday party when you all lived, you, all of you lived in Lindale, I think it was, oh, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. And, and no, we no, we were living in actually Burbank, California. Oh, was it? oh okay. And uh, Matthew was turning eighteen. Okay. And we were celebrating his birthday, and invited everybody that we you know knew. And of course, we had just Keith was like kind of just kind of came out of the blue, you know, and uh, and I had a we were doing a recording of Narnia. There, roar of love in that, in that house. Uh, we had set up a studio there. You recorded it in the house. Uh huh. Whoa, oh, yeah. cool. Well, the studio was in the garage, and then okay, and then the wires came through the walls, so there were no <laughs> windows, and it was so fun because Buck couldn't see Matthew, and Matthew would make Buck crazy because Matthew could do anything right up to where the punch was. You know, he, he could, and Buck would, Matthew, are you ready? I, yeah, yeah, of course I'm ready. And so, but the, but because. Buck he now couldn't see, see him. <laughs> we got it done really quickly because Matthew was always right there. You know? Right. And uh, <laughs> but so we rented a harpsichord uh, for this one specific thing, and we we didn't do the, all the music in in house. We did right. it in uh, you know studios and right. all over. Sure. Because uh, uh, Michael Martin was working, and I mean it was it was the funnest album I think we've ever done in our lives. It was just so <laughs> cool. And all the wonderful musicians and the, the work and all that stuff. Anyway, so we I think we had to record just a little something, something. I don't know what it was. So now there, uh, the way the house was built was our I had the uh, piano in my bedroom. And then you go down the hallway and then you go through the living room and then there was a nice turn the corner, make a U, and you could go out to the patio again with big French doors, and you go out there, and then you, it was open. Yeah. And our room was open to the patio. Right. So the piano was in my room, and the harpsichord was in the living room, right. and we started this conga dance. And <laughs> Keith would start off playing on the piano, whatever it was, you know, and then he'd run around, get, into the, get, get the harpsichord going. In. <laughs> so and we just did this like for hours, it seemed like, but of course it wasn't that long. But, it, but everybody, everybody in the conga line. It was so much fun. Oh. It was just a great, great time. Oh, that's great. What are your memories of Keith? My memories of Keith was that he needed to be settled. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first time I saw him, I thought, whoa, he's, he's rather... <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of bold. And I thought, well, good for him. Good mm -hmm. for him. That's who he was. And um, when he wanted something, he was he just you know, straight to the fact. You know, it was none of this this stuff. It kind of, kind of like Buck in a way, mm -hmm. but Buck wasn't like that. But Buck just goes to the chase. He doesn't. He's not good for small talk. Mm -hmm. You know, he's it just doesn't work with him. And so I remember Keith calling up Buck because he wanted something. He was, Hi, is Buck there? And I. Went, uh, Buck. Yes. Oh, Buck's here. Yes. <laughs> is Keith? Yes. I said, hi. You know, this this is Annie. How are you doing today? And he just was silent. And he just goes, I'm fine. How are you today, Annie? <laughs> <laughs> I can play the game, but I need to talk to Buck. <laughs> I tell you, he never called again when I answered the phone. He and he always said, Good morning, Annie. How are you today? He didn't go. He didn't do that push button thing. That just doesn't work. That just, it's just like, I'm a person. I am not a conduit for Buck. I'm not a secretary. You can't, can't do that. Right. You cannot do that. But uh, but but I'll never forget his love. A very loving, very kind, very generous. He had the most gorgeous eyes that would twinkle and humor 
um, he was very, very kind to us as a ministry, as individuals. He truly, he truly loved us, and um, and we loved him. And I, the last time I saw him, we were at his. We were our our properties were adjacent, so in Texas. We went, before we went to on on the road the next day, the night before they would always prepare supper for us, and none of us had to do that also, and then get ready for the road. It's very thoughtful. So this is that night before we went off to New York to minister with David Wilkerson, which was an amazing experience. <clears throat> I heard him open up the door at the big cafeteria, and I could hear him say, Annie, Annie, Nellie, come here. So we went outside, and the sky was aflame with beautiful colors from the Texas. The sunsets are just amazing. It was like it was a second coming. You know, and Nellie and I, oh, my gosh. And we said, yes, he's coming soon. And, and he's... He said, yes, he is. And that was... Just days before. Yeah. I mean, it was just so... So and I think my last day with Keith was wonderful because it was... he, And it was right near there that the crash crash was. So it wasn't how we expected it. And it uh, definitely, uh, definitely rocked the world because I think we needed... We felt we needed um, more, of, more of Keith. Are you still writing songs? Me? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. What is the outlet for the songs you're writing? Well, I don't do concerts anymore. I'm not recording anymore. I um, I speak them out. They're an intercession, a lot of them. And a lot of them are a proclamation of healing and uh and, and reminding myself that I am healed. Um, praying for others. And then when we do have gatherings, sometimes to um, play and, and sing and, and minister. But it's always at a personal, it's at a personal level. And it's... I was going to say, so it's a pretty much a private Yeah, thing. it's private, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I just open up my windows and just play... <laughs> play really hard <laughs> and I had one neighbor that said to me oh I love it when you play the piano it just it just rings through the mountains and it's just so wonderful and uh, you know and he he's he's my I love him to best and he doesn't think he knows the Lord but I know he does but he you know he protests like I don't but he, he he's too tender in here not to know something of the truth and but he just he just loved it he loved loves that so so you just don't sing for public anymore? Uh, I'll wait. Well, no. I mean, I'm sure if somebody asked me to sing, I would. But that's not, uh, it's not part of the agenda in our lives anymore, too. You're officially retired, mm-hmm. in other words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a sadness in that for you? Oh, my gosh, yes. Every day. Okay. Yeah. I miss... Um, there's a certain wonderful pattern in your life when you're out ministering and you get to sing these songs that, that God has given you that are that are life changing, that 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 are meaningful, that are his that are the truth and it's his spirit and they were given in spirit and they were given to uh to draw people to the Lord. And then you see that and you watch it like when you're singing or standing and singing or playing piano, you can see exactly where uh oh, the, uh oh, and they get the oh, they, get the, and it's just wonderful to be able to see that and to have that. But I think it's the the feeling of having the cleansing flow constantly going, and when you're on the road, because it's right there, it's right. just every day, and you have to be disciplined and prepared to do what it is that He has called you to do. And then, of course, when you do what He has called you to do, there's such joy and. And he just, it, 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 it's a delight. It's a privilege. And so I, but I, I miss, I miss that. So I, I find it, uh, I don't know if the word is difficult is right, but I find it more, uh, it takes me longer to, uh, 
to get to that that honing place in my spirit where I feel like I'm I'm being wrung by the by the music maker, you know, and and it just takes a little longer, but it, that's okay. I have time, and I choose to let him do it at his time, you know. Even though I wish he would just do it all the time. Are there songs that you've written, either your solo stuff or second chapter songs, mm -hmm. that you, you mentioned Easter song a while ago that or we, we were talking, or, or I don't, can't remember if we've said it while we're recording or not, that there was a little bit of a surprise that it was as popular. Oh. I mean, oh, yeah. well, uh, but were there songs that you thought, I think this is really going to minister and I think this is going to go far. This just sounds like a song that's going to really yeah. talk to people. Yeah. And it just really didn't. No. Yeah, I'm sure. There's, there's there some some songs, you know, somebody said, what's the best song you, you've ever written? And I go, the one I'm writing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> they're all like babies for me. Right. So I, I don't have a, 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 a personal favorite. Right. Uh, and... And I think when we retired, then there was there was a, I didn't listen to a lot. And lately, I, I've listened to a few uh, albums, and I just go, the lyrical content. Oh, and I look at Buck, and I say, no wonder I'm tired, you know, <laughs> no wonder. But it, it there's such a, it's 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 watching a, a life that has been able to. Because of the grace of God, been able to say, I can hardly wait to hear him say, well done. Two more questions for you, please, ma'am. Do you have, and it's a, become a favorite question for me to ask. Oh, dear. Do you have a favorite, when you look back on all the places that you've sung and all the places that you've been, do you have a favorite place in your mind that you go, I will never forget standing on this stage or, or holding this person's hand while I sang to them or just some place in your mind that you go back to and say, this was such oh. a privilege or such a night I'll never forget? I have too many. Give I me don't. One. Give me, give me I don't. one. Give me one. Well, you know, after concerts, we would always go down and pray with people. Sure. And I remember this one mom, she came backstage, and she had a little girl. She was five. And she said, this is my, my daughter, Cammie. Would you ask her if she wants to receive Jesus? And, I, I, and she was a tiny little thing. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I know when I was five, I understood a lot. You don't, a five-year-old knows a lot. A five-year-old knows when they're sinning. There's, you, know, you know, when you're wrong. Yeah. And so I, I said, oh, I said, can I hold you? She said, yes. So I picked her up and I walked with her and backstage. And I prayed with her and she received the Lord. And we just walked back and forth and I remember just holding her singing over her, understanding more and more how God wanted to, to use this little child. And then I think it was about 30 years later, I heard, heard from her. And it's all good. But you have these moments that are like that. And I, I can't narrow it down to one specific or... I, some of them, if I shared them with it, would probably embarrass the person that I'm, I'm and I don't want to ever uh, compromise or, or, or embarrass anybody, but some very deep and wonderful things that are very, very personal. Sure. And I, I got to be part of that and then watch the growth yeah. and then watch the deliverance and then watch the, the process of God using them. And um, there's just, yeah. That's beautiful. Last question. When it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? Mm -hmm. Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
was not. Should I write it down? <laughs> mail it to you, let you think about it? No, I, I, I don't know. I, faithful and true? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. That's an answer. That's an answer. <laughs> Woman of God had her song check catch her net out every day. Yeah. <laughs> Did what catch, she was catching songs. That's right. <laughs> oh, here's a good one. Floating by. <laughs> <laughs> Oop, missed that one. Come back tomorrow. I'll be here. <laughs> oh yeah. Just piles Annie, of fun. Annie, you have blessed the world for so many years and you I, and you know that. I mean but I just uh, I thank you for just a ton, ton, ton mm. of people. Oh it's it's a surprise. It's all a surprise, a wonderful surprise, you know, that God would do what he, what he, Buck and I sit at, at having coffee in the morning and we say, for a couple of kids who are just kind of, hmm, look what God has done. And, and I, I'm, I'm saying that not to pat us on the back, but I'm saying that because there are so many people who feel so inadequate and they don't dare trust and they feel like God is telling them something but they are afraid to share it. Well, I know what that's like, you know, and find somebody you can share it with, you know, because it will grow. It will grow. And we are all, we are all not perfect this side of heaven. So we don't have to try to be perfect, but he is perfect. So we will be perfect because he is perfect. And um, I just, I see a lot of people that are afraid to be vulnerable, afraid. Oh, if they knew that about me, they would not like me. Right. Boy, the minute I opened up my heart to the body of Christ about my sins, um, and I thought for sure they would just kick me away, it made them love me more. And I think that's why I, I, I'm so encouraged when I see someone who is so broken. I go, oh, honey, you're broken. God can use you. Because God is the mender. He is a mender. And he will use you. So I, I don't like being broken. I don't like being vulnerable. I don't like it, but I do love it. David used to do 